So I'm going to hand it over to Tim, who's tonight's moderator, and uh, he will take it from here. So thank you very much, Maddie, uh, for the invitation. And uh, so I was actually invited here as a representative of the Ready Center, and Ready is a nonprofit that I run um, based in the neighborhood, but we focus um, with a broader lens, and it stands for Resilience, Education, Training, and Innovation, or Ready Center. Um, but I will be stepping out of that role and into my role as an artist uh, for the discussion, and that is under an umbrella of what I call assembly. And I want to start by doing um, a land acknowledgement that we are here on the lands um, that were the home of the Lenny Lenape, who were called the Lenape Hokam, and there was a name for Red Hook, um, which is you know, a small part of that. We acknowledge that this is their land and their relationship, uh, our, our relationship is to their territory, and we um, welcome you know, them into back into these lands that we taken from them, they were dispersed across the country, um, and you know, there's a hope that there it will be a rebalancing um, of that disruption that, that took place um, when we invaded and, and took over here and changed not only the population, the human population, but the landscape uh, tremendously and dramatically in a way that's, that still has a lot of healing to be done, and I hope that we'll be talking about some of that tonight. Um, I'm going to start a timer for myself because I tend to talk long, and uh, we promised that we would not have a, well, you're going to have some presentations of people's work to begin with, so I'll try to not run too long on it. But I want to explain a little bit about what assembly is. Um, it's a, I was a um, studio artist for many years working in collaboration with my wife. I went back and got a PhD, which they say is the perfect way to kill an art practice, uh, I came out with a new practice that I call institutional sculpture, and it's a practice of creating or shaping institutions within and beyond the realm of art, um, and I consider it a participatory artwork that incorporates all stakeholders, knowingly and unknowingly. So you are all now participatory stakeholders, whether you like it or not. Um, and the slides are going to be a little bit hard to see, but basically there's a combination of all different sorts of uh, media and experiences that I get involved in, and sometimes they're existing institutions and sometimes they're new institutions, but I consider myself to have a sort of a sculptural role of interacting with the people and the places and the things. This is a picture from one of my projects, which was called Gulliver's Gate. It's a miniature world that was in a um, museum. It was a museum in, in Times Square that was a huge business venture that did not last very long, but was a, a heck of a good time with a big budget. Um, first, First assembly activity was assembly of logistic bohemianism, and that was <coughs> offering friends the alternative to getting married um, in the what was what was uh, allowable back at the time. This was before everybody uh, could marry any way they wanted to. So we created um, a ceremony that was responsive to what the couple wanted uh, to do. Then my home was destroyed in Superstorm Sandy. I lived just a few blocks away from here, and. So rebuilding of our house as an elevated home uh, adapted for, for the flooding and the rising waters uh, was a project that we called Elevated Assembly, and the home itself is a sculpture um, and social uh, by the fact that there were a lot of people involved. One of the activities that we held during that was called Disassembly, where I invited the public to come in and help wreck the house uh, and make it turn it into a kind of a playground. And my children got the chance to demolish their own bedrooms, which they would never live in again, which was a lot of fun for them. They're now respectively 17 and 14 years old, but essentially they were displaced for half of their lives. So we would consider our, you know, them as sort of first-generation climate refugees, and in six years they lived in seven different locations as we waited to get back into our homes. And luckily, we were people of such privilege that that was an actual possibility, that we were able to harness the the powers of finance and white privilege to, to get back home, uh, whereas many do not get to have that. Um, so as I mentioned before, Gulliver's Gate, this was a $40 million uh, Times Square project that, uh, that, that built uh, with about 600 people all over the world, um, miniature versions of their homes um, from every continent. And it was, uh, I would say, foundationally inequitable in that I got fired for um, listing all of the collaborators. 
uh, at the opening of the museum. I uh, created a film that credited everybody who was involved and the, uh, the leadership of the organization did not like that. They wanted to take credit for it. So, so that was every assembly project that I do teaches me a lesson and that giving credit and sharing credit is a very valuable lesson that I learned from that one. And so this is it. It was very sensational, um, uh, you know, as Times Square is. We, when we launched, we got a billion impressions, they said. So we were on every news, TV news all over the world. Uh, you know, if something opens in Times Square, it becomes a big, big deal. Um, then I had another project that was with NYU trying to create a um, business art or business and art overlap. I am a, a faculty member at NYU in the business school. And this was um, another situation that failed quite dramatically because the, the NYU was not ready to put um, their enormous uh, financial support behind this project that didn't really make sense to them. So they walked away from that one. Um, and I think that failure is a really important part of my practice. And I try to find it to be very instructive and also motivational um, because I think that failure is Probably some of the best lessons that we have. Uh, this was another one. Uh, didn't exactly turn out the way it was supposed to be, but it was a creative co-working space that uh, we were a part of at Ready Center's first home was there, and it has evolved into something that uh, the people who own it wanted it to be, so that's good for them, but it's not as collective as we had once thought it was. So I think that understanding the intent of, of those in control is important. Um, and then got into some really megalomania uh, ideas, uh, which was this formation of a new island off the coast of Red Hook. Um, that didn't happen, um, but again, a lot of uh, potential there, a lot of interesting ways of thinking. Now, uh, working on Ready Center, and our uh, lead project is called Blue City. Blue City is four and a half acres of water, privately owned water here in Gowanus Bay, which is just, uh, just down the street here and the idea is that as our neighborhood goes back underwater where it was before um, we will need to have new adaptation plans for how we're going to um, exist here and so what we are doing is designing floating infrastructure um, and we're doing it in a very collective community oriented collaborative fashion that's inclusive and gives people very practical hands-on ways of getting involved in climate adaptation um, there's a strong education component, we say from pre-K to PhD. We did start a school in the neighborhood, it's called the Harbor Middle School, which is related to the Harbor High School. Um, but we also have doctoral students from Brooklyn College uh, and, and other places that we work with. So a lot of educational relations as well. And a huge uh, sort of uh, uh, stakeholder group um, from all different sectors, government, private, nonprofit, and educational. So it's a lot of coordinating between different um, warring forces, almost none of which have to do with, uh, with fine art or visual art, which is a big change for me, but a welcome one. Um, and then we have three major thrusts. We do what we call local power, which is about renewable energy, Blue City, which is the floating development that I talked about, and then the learning space. And we have a, a, it's a floating field station or barge down in the water there. Um, and then we have a school, which is a community school called the Harbor, the, the Harbor Middle that I mentioned, um, and lots of other programs in schools around the city. Um, we do look at ourselves very much as a community organization that brings people together from every step of the way um, along major projects. We are looking to develop uh, specifically technologies that will do a lot of water restoration um, and using uh, natural, like artificial constructs that create the acceleration of natural systems because the natural systems are, have a multiplier effect that anything we build cannot operate nearly as well as what we let grow. Um, and so we do, again, we do a lot of involvement um, and we like to think of our collaborators as, as being all kinds of animals, human and otherwise. Um, and we do have uh, our first kelp plantation um, not in the water right now, we'll be harvesting it in the spring, and we'll be using it for two purposes. One is for biogas generation um, to, to do some cooking and heating with, uh, and also to mix in with concrete to create the, uh, the floating forms that are going to be the basis for our floating 
buildings and urban gardens and so on that will go out into this water. And this is the site. It's, um, it's about 1,200 feet long and 150 feet wide, so this diagram is not actually accurate. Um, but basically, it's the idea that we'll be developing an industrial area on the water that is um, a marriage of the three ideas that are the topics for tonight, which is the ecology, economy, and equity. So I will leave it at that and say that that's what we'll be talking about tonight, um, circularity, sustainability, uh, recycling, upcycling, and so on. Um, we have a couple of um, public events uh, every year that are specifically focused, like almost like academic, but really professional conferences. One in the fall is urban ocean stewardship. One next week is, is called uh, Ocean Stewardship from the Bronx to Brooklyn. That's a boat tour during Water Week of next week, and anyone who's interested, I can share the information about that with Maddie. Um, there's still some, some seats left on the boat, um, and so there's the, uh, the URL for that, but again, Maddie will have that. And we are uh, a public space uh, on the water, and so there are often opportunities for people to come down and get involved. So watch us on Instagram. I went way over, I'm sorry, uh, 10 minutes. Anyway, I will take a seat and uh, let others do their presentations. Hi, um, my name's Ivan. Thank you uh, to the Historical Center and uh, the Artist Collaborative for the chance to chat with you about the ghosts of the Red Hooks Water Pass. I am a nerd. Uh, <laughs> One of the worst kind there is. Uh, someone who is interested in, sorry, this thing seems to be on auto. Um, let's go back. Uh, so I'm a nerd. My fascination is with um, these strange things called tide mills. These are green energy structures that used to be all over Red Hook, and um, they took the power of the tides incoming force of water to make wheels turn to do things, make flour, cut boards, and they weren't just in Red Hook, they were all over the city. So those red dots were the tide mills and mills of New York City. There were so many of them that we even had one on our city logo. Unfortunately, over time, as technology changed, um, we replaced these with parking lots and public housing. And now we are dealing with um, problems that are related to that change. To understand how they worked, I started mapping all the buried streams and marshes of the city. Those are the green lines that you see uh, there, and we are a city of water. We built our economy on that water. Um, it made us strong, but it also made us vulnerable because we get flooding from that ocean that allowed us to link to the world. And you here are in Red Hook, you're only too familiar with the theme that yes, you will get wet from time to time as floods roll in. And this brings me to the theme of this evening, this poetic idea by Tony Norris that water has memory, that it will always want to go back to where it was. And to understand this poetic thought, I developed something called CSI, Creek Scene Investigation, a set of clues of how you can go into your backyard, your streets, and find out where the ghosts of waters past were. Some of them are obvious, like big trees growing on springs, puddles, big buildings, I'll explain. But what I want to explore with you tonight is the one in art. Because <coughs> artists capture the environment as it changes. And you may scratch your head and think, what is this view that he is showing us? What has this got to do with Red Hook? It is Red Hook. You're in Brooklyn Bridge Park, looking south to the little island called Cypress Island. You're right there on this little moraine ridge that used to connect Red Hook Island or Cypress Island to the Brooklyn mainland. And twice a day, this would flood with water. This picture is by William Guy Wall, 1825. It shows Red Hook at high tide. Red Hook was a waterland. We forget that. And there were tide mills all over the place. This is the Seabrings tide mill that used to make all the gin for the uh, British Royal Navy. And you, uh, over time, we landfilled all these tide marshes. We filled them with garbage, we filled them with rocks, uh, with things we didn't want. 
and we got the problems that came with that. As we destroyed the cleaning function of the water, we now have these things called combined sewer overflows. We now have these problems called flooding. And you may ask yourself, what, how did artists capture this? This, if you were in Paris in the 1840s, you would have been surrounded by smoke and pollution and smog. What would you have dreamt of? You would have dreamt of Red Hook. This was a view of the natural beauty of America which Europeans aspire to. These are the Red Hook salt marshes. This is where you are on what is, was then water. And this is the type of art that we really is so useful to me to try to reconstruct the ecosystem of uh, Red Hook's past. And this is not even an original painting. It's taken from a sketch by William Henry Margaret from what is now Sunset Park. And it's difficult to read, but it contains invaluable clues. Because when I combine it with the historical maps of what our neighborhood look, used to look like, William was standing right at what is Sunset Park today. This was the Brooklyn Forest. We're on, we're on, this is still on the 1845, and you can still see the palm mill ponds and salt marshes of Red Hook here. You can see the beginning of the Atlantic docks showing up. And this set of clues, these, these old maps, these, this art, allow me to piece all these elements together to try to reconstruct what the living life was underneath our feet. Underneath this concrete, there used to be fish swimming. There used to be part-time salt marshes. There used to be Indian trails. It's difficult to read with the light here, but there used to be Indian trails, these red lines running to Cypress Island because there was a fresh water source there that you could go and have a fishing settlement there in the summer. And this Ecology, you may scratch your head and say, well, it's very poetic, it's very nice, but what does it mean for the present? And suddenly you hear a screech of a car out in front of your house and someone cursing. And you say, oh, damn, someone's hit that pothole again. <laughs> and you um, had this wonderful system here in New York City called 311, where if you're pissed off about something, you hit 311 and you say, there was a goddamn effing pothole right at this spot here. And there are nerds like myself who go through that data, take all the curse words of Brooklyn, pile them up, and make them into big red dots. The bigger the dot, the more obscenities you will hear in red. And it turns out that we're right here. The place where we curse the most is just up the street. And then I'll say, hmm, why are people so upset about that particular intersection? And I will go pull out the old maps, and I'll go, hmm, right there, there seems to be a stream bed right where everyone's really upset. And then when I zoom in, and I go, okay, that's where everyone's complaining, and I go, oh, that's where the old artesian spring was. And if I put my ear to the sewer manholes right along here, I can actually hear the water still running. And it turns out that that ghost stream you thought was dead is still very much alive and causing real problems in a real way even today. And all of this, you may think, okay, that's kind of cool, um, but we need to start thinking about what are the solutions to some of these problems, to these potholes, to this flooding. You can walk around your neighborhood, you'll see your neighborhood. Neighbors are starting to put little sump pumps in their basement to get the artesian springs coming out. And that means by playing Join the Dots, you can start reconstructing the streams in your yard. And just remember, when the apocalypse comes, <laughs> you'll want to remember this address. This is the only fresh water supply in Red Hook. And you'll be there with your pointy sticks guarding it because it's a precious natural resource. The data that I've piled up, you can get it through Red Hook uh, Water Stories, a wonderful group called Portside. Download any of the data there if you want to find out why there's a puddle in your backyard. And uh, more importantly, use the data to start debating how can we solve our problems. We are going to be flooding again and again and again. The Army Corps is proposing to build a series of seawalls, floodgates, big mechanical things that will open and close on demand. And uh, this data allows you to come up with some debates. Uh, up until March 30th, you can comment on this. 
we have a thing called the back cup problem, for example. The water may not just come from the ocean, it may come from the other side, from behind us. Because it turns out that when uh, Ida happened, the dozens of people who died in Queens, they were not killed by the water coming from the ocean. They were surprised by all street lights quickly flooding their basements. We had a dozen people drowning in the uplands. So the bathroom problem for you to debate. And another thought, machines fail. Anything mechanical, if you've ever owned a car, you will go, oh, not would not work. And uh, this is a photo balloon view of the Gowanus Canal right up to Sandy when the sewer pumps fail. And millions of gallons of sewage poured the right now. So debate for the Army Corps. Will a machine-based tidal gate system always work? Can we guarantee that? Um, of course, there are natural solutions we can start debating. Then you mentioned one building offshore reefs. The memory of the bay was that there was a large oyster reef off Red Hook that protected us from tidal storm surges. We had large ponds to absorb where that water wanted to go. Unfortunately, what is happening is where those mill ponds are, is where we're piling more and more dirt. This is, these are the Red Hook sports fields, where the old mill ponds were. We're dumping more and more dirt on them. Mm. If any of you ever want to go hang out in Fort Defiance, you can discuss what I call the martini flood challenge. You take a martini glass, you fill it to the rim, and you start dropping olives into it, and see how many olives will go in there before it overflows. You think, what's this got to do with flooding? It's exactly the same problem you have in Red Hook. You put too much dirt on the pond, at some point the martini will spill into your lap. And that is um, the debate of what are some of the solutions. Flood parks, for example, our friends in Holland have developed wonderful plans for parks that can flood in a resilient way. Street creeks that direct where water may want to go when it comes in and it goes back out and watershed-wide planning where we think in a massive, comprehensive way about what the memory of our landscape wants to be, where the marshes were, where the water wants to flow, and that we start putting the concept of water back into the waterfront. And I thank you uh, for opening up some really great debates, and if anyone wants to access this data, you can get it through this QR code or by shooting me an email at Ivan, and, uh, the data will be there for you to explore your own backyards. Thank you. Talk about, but a couple of comments. I actually find that I was familiar with your work because I had done some research around 2014 on Darcy Thompson and the restoration, and he's known for a 1917 publication from forces to forms. And in thinking of how this reflects on art, I was very taken with an article that appeared in the New York Times showing that you were using paintings to locate some of the locations of the watersheds. So that was one way instantly I found that, um, that this was of concern to artists and art could really make a difference. Now, a lot of, so far, the two people presenting have talked mostly about the ecology, but for me, hand in hand with issues of ecology, a lot today has to do with issues of empire, colonization, um, and globalization and how those interact with ecology. So um, Maddie's uh, commission, so to speak, was to charge each of us with looking at the objects from the New York Historical Society and finding a way to relate uh, one of the shows that they had, a part of the collection, to what is happening in ecology, and specifically in Brooklyn area, 
And of course, I immediately thought of Thomas Cole's The Course of Empire, which he did from roughly 1833 to 1836, although people say he started as early as 1829. Um, and it seems to me that it is almost hand, um, it, it's really of a piece with the issues that we see coming up today about empire. So I wanted to look at it hard again and reevaluate it. How many people here are familiar with the work? It consists, I see a few heads. It consists, pardon? With the yes, call. with a call. call. <laughs> yeah, with a call. Courts of Empire. I know there's art historians and art lovers here. There are five works that are interconnected. Um, to my surprise, when I first came across it, I realized they are not associated with specific views of the Hudson. Um, he lived in Hudson, um, and uh, actually that is a place now that has been set aside for special attention. But he took a trip that was really important to him, to Europe, uh, collections in, um, in Paris, in Rome, uh, in paintings having to do with Greece, um, these were, he was researching ideas of empire. Now the titles that he used, try to get some light here, um, the five parts, the savage state, Arcadia, or the pastoral state. The third was the con consum consummation of empire, then destruction, and then desolation. So I have found a way to interpret these, each part of this allegory with materials and colors that um, I located from other parts of the New York Historical Society collection because there were shows that uh, took place over the years, notably one I believe in 2000. 19, which I saw before COVID, having to do with issues of pollution and ecology. So um, that was one source of things. I was also trying to relate the colors that I use, cobalt, cadmium pigments, to the kind of mining issues and extraction issues that we see coming up time and again um, when you talk about globalization um, and certainly talk about empire. So the empire that is presented by Cole is, in some, to some historians, it was a cyclical kind of thing um, having to do with the political concerns of the time with the then president's expansion of territories, but it's still consider, uh, considered, it's now still, those issues are still very pertinent. Um, today I would say that writers, authors like Amitav Ghosh and David Graeber and David Wendring, um, their views on the empire are right on the mark, uh, and maybe more so than older views right now. I'm thinking of art historian Barbara Novak, um, and I'm also thinking of Leo Marx's publication, Machine in the Garden, which was about the effects of industrialization. So how could I even begin to make some of the points and differences I wanted one thing I've noticed is that almost every artist in the show is reliant on maps. I'm no exception to that. Um, but in addition to that, I've included what they call, and I just learned this recently, 
cadastral maps, which has to do with evaluation uh, for taxation purposes. So I got interested in that. Um, I've always used patent citations as a source of information, uh, supplying information about the economy and invention and technology as well. In addition, um, I was using some of the land deeds. And I've, what I've done is I've placed this additional information on fairly heavy paper, like parchment paper, and placed some of it behind strips in front of it to suggest the erasure that's been going on in history. And for people who have read Amitav Ghosh's The Nutmeg's Dilemma or the Graver books, what a lot of historians are, or historians like these are now trying to do is look to other than Western sources as primary sources, to look at civilizations that have been marginalized whether they're Native Americans or others, and see what could be, whether there is a different approach, more of a bottom-up approach. It's no surprise, for example, to realize that David Graeber, uh, who's one of these authors, became one of the chief forces behind Occupy. Now, in terms of industry, which I've mentioned, several times. One of the industries that was going on at the time Thomas Cole was painting The Course of Empire was the brick making industry. New York was a place of bricks. To make bricks, you need mud. And what happened was that um, there were two fires around this time in New York. I think they were 10 years apart, but basically, because of the fires, bricks became really a necessity and were in high demand. Um, and so what I have done is use an augmented reality um, animation, uh, which I did with the help uh, technically of David Levy and a friend who supplied some of these bricks that were inlaid with the names of the manufacturers, which you can see in many people's backyards along here, to tell a different story of history. One, a history that is based on mud flows, on straw and bricks, rather than just human fears. And affairs that, that animals and non-humans take part in. I think all of us in our work in different ways in this show are really trying to do this. And I thought also, what is a good title for this? What, how could I sum up my interest? And I think of it, the totality of the installation for my part as a palimpsest, where you can see one thing after another. And to conclude my part of this, I'd like to read from Darcy Thompson's 1917 growth. If only I had some light here. Okay. okay. In growth and form, he said, um, thank you. Immediate views and old inheritance are blended in nature's handiwork as in our own, in the marble columns and architraves of the Greek temple. We still trace the timbers of the wooden prototype and see beyond these the tree trunks of a primeval sacred grove. Roof and eaves of a pagoda recall the sagging mats which roofed an earlier edifice. Anglo-Saxon land tenure influences the planting of our streets and the cliff dwelling and cave dwelling linger on in the construction of our homes. So we see enduring traces 
of the past in the living organism, landmarks which have lasted on through altered function and altered needs. And this is where I think we are. Thank you. My name is Deborah Schmidtbach, and um, I am the Curator of Decorative Arts and Special Exhibitions at the New York Historical Society. Um, as part of my job, I oversee the object collections in the museum, um, which includes approximately 85,000 objects, um, ranging from traditional decorative arts like silver, furniture, ceramics, glass, um, jewelry, and other types of metals, but also things like historic relics, um, maritime art and artifacts, horse-drawn vehicles, uh, business and household tools and, and equipment, and archaeological materials. So it's a very, very wide range of materials. Um, another part of my job is that I curate many different kinds of exhibitions. And I think I've, I've done uh, three or four dozen exhibitions for the Historical Society at this point. Um, generally focusing on social history issues, uh, Jewish American history, history um, material and pop culture exhibitions. Um, New York's, the history of New York as um, a harbor and a port is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, we think about New York um, as, a, as a, an important port of the past, but also an important port for the present. And um, one of the other exciting things that I do in my job is that I acquire new objects for the museum collection. So in the, over the past 18 months, um, one of the more exciting projects I've been involved in is that we um, commissioned a two-row wampum belt from um, an artist named Lydia Wallace Chavez, who is um, the founder of a company called Wampum Magic, and she is also a member of the Amichog Nation. Um, the, her company, Wampum Magic, designs um, and specializes in wampum, and they make jewelry and other kinds of artistic materials from shells that are native to Long Island Sound. Um, as many of you might know, or probably know, wampum is actually made from quahog, or quag, as it's sometimes pronounced, and whelk shells found in and around coastal New England and uh, the mid-Atlantic. And so Wampum Magic specializes in making goods that are from shells that are sourced from um, the shores of, of Suffolk County in Long Island, um, which is part of their, the Akachog's traditional uh, homeland in New York. Um, interestingly, the Akachog Nation is known for creating exceptional wampum, and they were known for this well before European contact which is very, very interesting, something I didn't know prior to working on this commission. Um, wampum was generally worn and exchanged as symbols of ritual and status. Um, and the belt that we just acquired, which will go on display at the end of this month, um, really is a record of historical treaties or other historical events. So we're very, many museums have wampum in their collection. We have very, we had very little, so I'm very proud that our first wampum is something that we were able to commission from the Akachog Nation um, from Long Island. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about what the museum collections provide to the community as a place for research and education. So New York Historical Society is uh, New York's first museum. Uh, we were founded in 1804. And we have been collecting and preserving uh, and interpreting artifacts and documents related to the history of New York, but also the history of the United States through the lens of New York since 1804. Um, today, our museum and library holds a remarkable trove of art, objects, and documents that have been gathered for over two centuries. Um, these work form also form the core of our exhibitions and as well as our public programs and educational initiatives. And it is our hope that through these different types of programs, our visitors can engage with the collection and better understand and contemplate both the past and the present and uh, where we're going in the future. Uh, so whether it's families with young children uh, who enjoy antique toys displayed in our Children's History Museum, 
or visitors enjoying the beauty of the Hudson River School paintings um, that have been mentioned. Um, you know, we really, at, or scholars study manuscripts in our library, we really try to um, show our art and our objects for people of all ages and all walks of life. Um, artists also form an, a very important core of, um, of the different types of people who use our collections and their <coughs> insights and, and, and interventions are very stimulating for us to learn about as well. In 2006, for example, uh, artist Fred Wilson mined New York Historical Society Museum collection to explore the contradictions of freedom and slavery uh, in the age of revolution. And this resulted in an installation called Liberty Liberté, which just juxtaposed a bust, a marble bust of George Washington and imagery <coughs> from the American, French, and Haitian revolutions um, with slave shackles from our collection to focus on our country's unfulfilled ideas. <coughs> um, during a more recent residency, right before the pandemic, Photographer Bettina von Zweil studied the collections and became very inspired by our cut paper silhouettes and paste photographic images. And her version uh, resulted in a powerful new photography series called Meditations on the Emergency. Um, when Maddie Rosenberg reached out to Marty Hofer, who was our museum director, about a collaboration with Central Booking, we were again very excited to do that. Um, the project was formally uh, launched in 2019, in the fall of 2019. Um, and many of you came for a day of uh, collection presentations, some of which I gave for the museum collection, and Michael Ryan, who was at the time the library director, um, was able to do with the library collection. And so uh, it's very exciting to see images of some of my good artifact friends. Um, really reflected in the works that we're seeing here. Um, we were just really delighted that you were inspired by um, the works in our library reading room, such as the maps and charts that we hold, um, as well as photographs and postcards, and that you were able to use our galleries and really gain inspiration from things like uh, Thomas Cole's Course of Empire <coughs> series, but also <coughs> Tiffany Lamps, our board game collection, and um, just many other categories of artifacts. So in addition to bringing fresh insights to our collections, um, the project again focuses on New York Harbor, and um, it's very much in line with another initiative we recently launched called the Climate Lab, which has brought new attention and urgency to understanding the relationship between environmental issues and history. And um, we are very, very grateful to all of you who have participated in On the Waterfront, and. Um, Hope that you continue to mine our collections for inspiration um, and ways to educate the public about this important issue. The only other thing I want to add to this is um, I am a longtime resident of Brooklyn. I raised two children here, um, and I'm also a sailing enthusiast. So I sail periodically um, through New York Harbor and uh, uh, have, have driven through Hellgate personally. Um, and I can tell you that riding through the waterways in the city is very exciting and can be very exhilarating, but it's also um, can be very, very upsetting to see all the plastic or mylar balloons that float in the harbor. And um, there are many places within this harbor that have been cleaned up in the last many years. And it doesn't take a federal grant to clean up these harbors. It also takes people being interested in actually picking things up or not throwing them in the water. So I again thank you all for inviting me here and um, I look forward to hearing more about the works. Hello everybody, my name is Sabra Booth and um, I'm very pleased to be a part of this awesome, vicious panel. I appreciate Mandy Rosenberg of Central Booking and inviting me uh, to Display my work in this exhibit and uh, the, the wonderful opportunity at the New York Historical Society where I did extensive research, uh, especially on maps of the Gowanus Canal, which is the focal point of my presentation. And this is me in my studio. I live in San Antonio, Texas, but um, I, used to, I used to live here. So you see a little bit of me 
that and then uh, my accoutrement uh, tonight is uh, what you see that I'm wearing. You step back so you can actually see me and my double. And uh, I am a printmaker, so I'm carving away. I have a woodblock print that's in this show. And uh, there's various characters that uh, populate my, my art world that you can see floating around me. Next. Or do I next? <laughs> Later, I went to grad school at Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. I came back to Houston, and I was just speaking with Deborah about um, that I was an exhibitions designer at a uh, small science museum, Holocaust survivors, uh, their family were survivors, and I was at the Ginsburg Nature Discovery Center. So um, that sort of uh, six years designing science exhibits sort of led the Board of Ed into hiring me as an earth science teacher, an artist who teaches earth science. Uh, and that's when I landed in, in New York City in the like, uh, late 90s. So there's, there's my, my first metro card, and there's, there's my, uh, my New York Board of Ed ID. And then I was Brooklyn bound, and there you see me literally bound on the roof of my apartment. Um, now my apartment, Here's the address, 145 Ninth Street, apartment 11. So uh, literally, almost on my doorstep was the Gowanus Canal. That's where I lived for five years, right by that canal. And I would cycle on the weekends over to Red Hook. I loved doing that every Sunday. Or I'd go over the Brooklyn Bridge, one or the other. Uh, so the canal became uh, so much uh, part of my instinctive memories of, of Brooklyn. So when Maddie brought up the waterfront, I immediately thought, Juana's Canal. And she's like, really? I'm like, yeah. That's, that's what I think of what, about my time here. So here is uh, the location near my apartment. And it's still, that I took that last March. And there were uh, plumes bubbling up. In fact, the Gowanus dredgers, whom I hung out with and did some uh, picking up of trash around the canal, uh, they told, they looked at my footage and they said, oh, that was a great plume. You really saw an actual, it looked like Yellowstone. <laughs> That's what I felt like, uh, where I was, it was bubbling up. And I did a watercolor of all the different colors. Um, it's beautiful. You know, it's toxic beauty. Just <laughs> and the shimmering and the iridescence. And uh, this is a nice view of downtown Brooklyn with the canal in the front. So um, in uh, 1999, uh, you all may recall, they started to flush the canal again. They, they got the flushing tunnel going. And briefly, crabs came back. They were scuttling around on, on the banks of the canal. It was so exciting. So I did this woodcut. And I, I, had set, I, I had very little money. I was teaching lots at that point for the Lower East Side Print Shop and the Brooklyn Arts Council working all over New York City. Um, so on one piece of Luan, I, I, I had to carve the front. It was thin. And I carved the back, too, and printed both. But this is the print that resulted. This is the F train crabs coming back, and there used to be old tires just hanging around on the banks of the canal. You don't see that now, but that's, it used to be much more gritty looking. Um, now the Brooklyn Arts Council, thanks to Agnes Murray, um, that addition is part of their print portfolio. So what I have here is the only proof I have from the addition. I'm also a Cancer, so I threw that into my zodiac signs. Um, this is uh, what's in, along with the print, I have this artist book, which is about the canal. And it's, um, I like the blue plate special, you know, two for one. 
One side is the Gowanus Creek, which is all very luscious, beautiful blues and greens and very pretty. The other side is the Gowanus Canal. What I know, and I meticulously marbleized paper in my studio, which frankly smells very nice. It's got walnut oil in it. It's mm -hmm. not what the canal smells like. Um, in order to try to get the look of all those mosaic swirls. And there's collage, found objects, natural on one side, industrial detritus on the other. Because I, I like to pick things up. <clears throat> I have, I don't know, magpie instincts. And this also is in the show. And using uh, a vintage porthole that I'm trying to find out the provenance on because it's from New York. I don't know which ship, but it's, I got it. I got it from New York, shipped to Texas to make the art to bring here. <laughs> so that's how, that's how it rolls sometimes when you make art. But these are watercolors that I did actually on the canal uh, 10 years apart. One, half of them are 2012, half of them are last March. And I found in both cases that I had uh, burning eyes, burning throat, a headache, nausea. Oh. Uh, but at least this year, I, or last year, 22, I was used to the mask. I was like, oh, I got my COVID mask. I'll put it on to do the rest of my sketching. Okay. And uh, here you can see a, a map of the Gowanus Creek. So I think it's been really interesting, our discussions uh, by the other panelists of the histories of, of the creek and of other waters, hidden waters within uh, New York City. And this is a, a Quora code that I have if you want to snap a shot of that. It's also over in the show. And uh, it's a progressive animation piece that's using an actual, actual book. So just to show a little bit more, and I'm going to check my phone or my clock. I don't want to go over. Okay. Um, this is a piece that uh, I did in San Antonio a huge installation relative to the winter storm Uri. So a lot of my work is ecologically based. Uh, that uh, was a storm that devastated San Antonio. And these are plants that I lost that froze to death uh, from that storm. But it's a light work and it used acrylic floor inks, which uh, the inventors are in this room, uh, Susan and William. So. Uh, beautiful, beautiful inks uh, to create the saturated images, and they're backlit, so it has a, a, a special effect. Um, there's a special connection between San Antonio and the Gowanus Canal. Brooklyn city leaders came to San Antonio in the 90s to look at the river walk and want to turn the Gowanus Canal into exactly what the San Antonio River Walk is which is absurd. That could not happen. Uh, I'm not saying the San Antonio River's clean, but there's no black mayonnaise at the bottom of it. That's for sure. Okay. Uh, this was a solo show I had uh, during COVID. I had uh, two visitors, but they were prominent. So I'm happy about that. But it was called Hot Pursuit, and uh, Maddie wrote the, the foreword to it. It's my uh, like 20 year body of work that's relevant to climate change. And this was a piece that inaugurated Central Booking in Dumbo, in Dumbo when she was in that location. It's called Mariposa Machismo. Um, and uh, that piece was relevant to an inundation of brown snout nosed butterflies that uh, all of the predators had been killed off. I mean, honestly, you're uh, those of you that drive, they would clot up the front of your car like butterfly butter, so the car would break down, not work. It, there were so many of them in the engine. 99% um, of them were male. Well, so it was like, where'd all the females go? So we have all these strange things happening with climate change, and it was definitely part of climate. And there was an article I wrote for one of the issues of uh, central booking catalogs. And I'll just 
close quickly with uh, my project Slick, with which my shirt is part of. This was an artist book that Maddie's also shown, made from rubber uh, gaskets that go within oil pipes that I silk screen and did relief printing on with Gulf Coast plants. And that was spawned by uh, the deep water horizon still in the Gulf. Um, so I care about water, whether it be Texas water, whether it be Atlantic water, whether it be New York Harbor or Bahamas Canal water. And that, that's, I'll show one more for Reese, that's a close up. Corpus Christi refinery. Oh, I guess that's it. Um, and I'll just mention a book that was very helpful to me. It was um, Joseph Alexiou's uh, The Gowanus Canal. I would recommend that if you read that. Uh, and also um, Heartbeats in the Muck uh, by Professor Waldman. That's John Waldman. That's really good too about the New York Harbor. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for the introduction uh, to the work. And so, as you see, this is a, a panel without a lot of homogeneity. Um, but I think that there are some, obviously some connections. But I wanted to start with a question um, that I was thinking about, because it's been a long time since I was at this space, the BWAC space. In fact, when I was here last, it was on the second floor. So my first question is, is not from this space, it's from upstairs. And the idea was, uh, the year is 2140. You're in the space, upstairs. You open the window and you look out. And what do you see? So, who wants to? Windmills. Windmills. <laughs> Go on. Well, I, I mean, that's just being discussed, you know, that within harbors near cities, you know, that, I mean, we have to have alternative, you know, energy sources, and it's controversial, you know, like, uh, in terms of the view, blocking the view, uh, and bird life as well, so that was immediately, because I, I think there is discussion of, of, you know. The leases have been sold. Yeah, well, identified. there you go. Yes. I mean, I've watched just the whole transformation of going from San Antonio to Corpus Christi with huge wind farms, I mean, huge. And fracking, but, and I've done work on that too. Um, I mean, there's a lot of water. Um, you know, we, I know that this the sea level also is probably going to be rising quite a bit, in many in the next several years. So um, that's what I would expect to see. Or at least the second floor might not be as high up as it as uh, we perceive it now. Yeah, the, the, the year, the 2140, is actually picked from um, a book by uh, a writer called Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson, who has been called the sort of George Orwell of our time. And he writes science fiction or climate fiction um, based in sort of scientific projections. And his, his book is all about life in Manhattan, and he doesn't really talk about Brooklyn. So I was just thinking based on some of the images that I'm been showing us, and the idea of when you get a little bit further out of the center in, in, in Manhattan, the water is breaking up Fifth Avenue, and sort of like buildings are collapsing and so on. But I thought that, you know, since we are here out in this little marshland, so that one, what do you think? Well, I, I happen to be a real fan of Kim Stanley Robinson. I've read everything he has written, including 2140, and the impressions of people swimming from one apartment to another are indelibly placed in my brain. But I also have to say that I think that he also has, I noticed that his books kept getting closer and closer to us in time, which is interesting. And actually, they seem to me to grow in optimism, which I think of seeing windmills connotes um, outside your windows. Um, I, I do feel that we have left a younger generation with a mess. I also feel that they will rise to the occasion and are really very intent on looking for solutions. Um, how this is going to happen 
I, I mean, I also believe, as with these books on empire, a more recent one being by uh, H, I believe, H-A-I-G-T, that corporations have been a large part of the problem. And some of this is um, there's enough public pressure to be driving things to a better um, state. I showed a map that was 300 years old, 1845, <clears throat> and the striking thing about it was that Brooklyn was all forest. It was much cooler. And when I look out of the window in 2140, what worries me is none of you will be here. You'll all be gone. And in 1600, 90% of the population of Brooklyn was wiped out by cholera. So it's not impossible that we all disappear. And the critical challenge for me is not so much flooding. We can run away from flooding, but we cannot run away from extreme heat events. So one of the critical things that I think you need to see in our landscape is a cooler landscape by any means necessary. Whatever we need to do to get better ventilation, systems going through the massive reforestation, massive urban cooling, otherwise we're going to be history ourselves. Yeah, and there's a, a book, um, J.G. Ballard's uh, Drowned World, that, that talks specifically about that, about the sort of creeping tropics. And when you said trees out the window, I immediately saw mangroves. And I think it's probably, you know, within that time span that we may be seeing mangroves surrounding us. But I actually agree with what Ellen was saying, is that this idea or feeling of climate dread is not a productive feeling. And I think that there's some sort of, when you when you do talk about climate catastrophe or climate dread, it's almost like you're trying to forestall the inevitable as opposed to you know, realizing that we have created the situation and now we have to look for what is the optimistic, what is the productive, or what is the sort of intergenerational, interdisciplinary approach to it. And when Deborah, you and I were talking for the exhibition, your concept of the collection for the historical society is absolutely crosses all boundaries and not, it's divided by the materiality of things alone is the category. So I just think of thinking about the way, how if you think about the way that an object is considered, what if we could see sort of society in that sort of similar you know, sort of blending? We still separate them so much. Yeah, um, I mean, we also have some categorization of different types of artifacts and objects, but um, you know, for us, because we're a history museum, um, any object has meaning and can be read for, as a historical document, and that's really kind of the crux of the way we approach things. So that's not to say that we don't appreciate a beautiful series of art like Thomas Cole's series, but um, you know we really try to look beyond ca art categorizations to come up with material. It can be a, a plastic cup or a napkin that will help us to um, explain to people what it says about our, our present and what it might say about our future. And I was thinking, Sabra, about you sitting down on the edge of the canal, absorbing the fumes for all of us. Um, that there's a, you know, the, the, the paintings that Iman was showing us. I had a question here, like, what is it as an artist that you can do in the face of the changing climate? And in a way, maybe you were being that artist that Iman showed us that was standing up on the hill in Sunset Park looking down at the waterways, that, that this document that you have created about what the canal is and what the reality of the canal is, is actually, it's very important. So you may view it as critical, you know, with your engagement with it, but how is it going to be viewed in 2140? Pick it up. Well, I think, I think there's going to be people in the future that are not going to be happy about all the, the lack of responsibility for, for caring for the resources for everyone. You know, and that, I mean, it's changing, 
you know, but it's like we're 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 in a, a, a race against you know impending doom, you know, uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, but I think I think when I was when I was working on those sketches to physically start to you know feel the effects of pollution, you know. So if my sketches look a little wonky, you know why? Because I, I was. I was getting a little lightheaded <laughs> as, I, as I'm doing it. Um, you know, but there's the other sketches I've done, like in, in Texas, I did one that was, there was a refinery, a salt marsh, there was, and, and then there was an oil derrick moving, and then just right next to it, right next to the highway, and I don't know if you've seen these up close, but these wind turbines are monstrous. They're, they're like dinosaurs. And it, so, I, in one view, I had all three at once. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's capturing the time that I'm living in. You know, so maybe someone will look at it down the road. Well, I, I think uh, I belong to an eco art listserv, and many of the proposals uh, from the artists are phytoremediation uh, processes. How to restore things, restoration. Um, my friend Aviva Romani talks about how she bought the village dump and basically has worked for more than a decade to restore it. So th these projects do have a lot of merit, but um, again, they're sort of um, not, not that one, but many of them, I think or a band-aid on the problem, that you really need not somebody here or there working in isolation, but you need many such uh, projects. And I think where Aviva, for example, is smart, is to go into the law. I think that the, um, I found that necessary in my own work because uh, patents, for example, are a mark um, of often property, property ownership, demarcating what is the commons. And I think that we need to look to the commons and the resources, which now include uh, resources of consciousness, mental. We have so much knowledge about how the brain works. We need to tap these and find uses that are good for our common good. Um, and I think that the authors that I'm looking to are really trying to do that, including Kim Stanley Robinson. One, one revolution that we've had that has allowed me to do what I do, take old maps, pieces of paper, is we have a digital revolution. So never before can I grab maps from 500 years and squeeze them all together. Never before can I talk to amazing people sharing artifacts. Just because you can ping me on my Instagram five seconds later, I can look at, oh, she's into Darby's Patch. You know what Darby's Patch is? It's a garbage dump that used to be up the street. And so this revolution is a resource for us. That we, you know, we have this unique moment before we get wiped out. We can take the correct information and use it for good. And that's what I'm hoping to presenting digital information that you're presenting artifacts that are relevant to our future and that is what we need to look at. It is more hopeful than just the 2140 disaster. So. But you're, you just came up in a book that I'm reading, um, Water Always Wins. And, <laughs> and uh, the author was talking about having discovered these water sleuths, water detectives, and not just here, but the same thing that you were talking about, um, someone out in San Francisco walking her around and showing her the puddles and saying, this puddle is always here. This is not a rainstorm puddle, but I think that, and, and I hadn't heard of the mills, the tide mills before, but this idea that the, the greatest strength is the strength that is much larger than the human and the natural systems are the only things that we can really count on because the hats the, the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, they're mega projects throwing as much money as you possibly can at something that is doomed for failure. I mean, we can't think about 
human intervention. Human intervention has gotten us to where we are. Yes, and we have to appreciate all the things that make us do things why we move to New York. There's often selfish reasons. We come here for money, we come here for jobs. The Army Corps operates in the same way. They develop large projects because they're lucrative, not necessarily because they're good. So what we need to focus on are what are the common goodness that we have where we all realize, okay, we're in this together. So even the good thing with COVID, people started getting nervous that we're all gonna die and we start doing things as neighbors, sharing resources, helping out the old people. And so we need to move out of these models of just traditional selfishness and look at more of what we have in common together, including sharing data. Like I'm telling you, don't put dirt on your car, you don't flood. They're not listening. <laughs> but they'll, at some point, it will have, it'll be done for you. Yeah. Well, Maddie said this is a conversation, not a bunch of people talking about people. Um, so we're waiting for people to converse. We have some interesting people in the audience, as well as saw some Harvard School gang sneaking a little bit late. <laughs> um, and I just would welcome people. I want to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Kayla and her mysterious partner we've never met before, um, and others, please join the conversation. Comments or questions? Or... Hi. Thank you. Second, um, my couple, uh, some time ago, I went to uh, Governor Island, and there are cellars, and there was tools to these cellars, and they were saying that um, temperature there, the same in the winter and in the, yes. So there is technologies were available with wind also tower, tower, uh, towers and and there are around the world a lot of technologies that were destroyed by new like windmills and new technology which is destroyed. Um, that's, that's I really appreciate you that you're doing this. Although, if we look at it, it, what your resources, and, and you say this is a new resource that we have to use, exactly this resource, and the production of this information, production of energy to use this, this uh, technology, and production of this technology, making situation worse <coughs> and worse. So, and I remember 40 years ago, it was not that bad then. I lived in different countries, in small um, town, but still, it was not that worse. It became worse, worse, and worse, and worse with developing new technologies. And windmills destroying a lot of areas around them. It's not only they producing. And again, these, these, um, these um, uh, they like common um, reason that, oh, we build this world, we all the generation, we created it, and they uh, have to like um, uh, solve it. But I remember when I uh, washed plastic bags, I still wash them. You see, because it's kind of, for me, it's normal. And I never play video games, I never uh, mine bitcoins, uh, I never, um, uh, speculate on cryptocurrency and this technology again using more and more and more energy and we have to produce it for new generation and there is not so many young young people who mostly all of us all the we think about so it's all these like reasons and consequences probably I am not sure that we really understand what is going on. You see, probably we raised this generation. Pro yes, it's our fault. We raised this generation that don't want to think about it. They just want to go, go further, and they have to, because this world became faster, faster, and faster, because again, of this technology, <laughs> this is the creating and this resource. So, it's, uh, how we get 
of these, I don't know what is this, this mm, uh, train that may be uh, going faster, faster, and faster. And one, one most, most small thing, you see, it's also, it became very sterile. For example, you look around, what uh, living beings, only humans, where frogs, where uh, flies, where uh, other insects, where swallows, I still remember that I had to kill all the time something that was in my childhood, you see. We don't want to deal with it, you see. So it's much, 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 no, I don't know, complex problem, how we do all this combined and solve it. Try to start to solve it. Okay, this wetlands and forests, they will produce frogs and animals and insects and we don't want to have that. The best is we leave it alone and it seems to come back. You had a question. Yes. No. Well, first, I, I do want to thank all of you and the panelists. I think it's been very provocative. Uh, but my question is really for Edmund D. Sure. And um, I really want to know, uh, I, I'm sure you, you've presented some of these ideas mm -hmm. <laughs> to the Army Corps of Engineers. I have. I can send you an extensive comments. And what did they say? Because it sounds so sensible, what you presented. Yes, it does. But again, there's political will. Because you have to appreciate a lot of money is invested in very lucrative projects. And again, if things are cheap and simple, people tend to get less interested in them. It is one of the problems of now. We live in a society where, OK, what's in it for me? And the Army Corps is no different. They Drain the Everglades, for example, and right. they realize, whoopsie, we screwed up, and then they did it the other way but, around. You so, know, buying the land where those puddles are, I mean, it's very convincing. Yeah. But there are positive things on so work. For example, we just did a big discussion with the mayor's office, yeah. and they are rec uh, on environmental resiliency, and they are recognizing that we need to deal with the street intersections that flood. And so we have now in Storm, uh, Southern Queens something called the Storm Surge System, uh -huh. where they're trying to connect all the little parks together. And gradually, these ideas come forward. But it's also people like yourself that I have to make propaganda to. You have to accept that you want to have trees in front of your house, and then, ah, oh, I've got to rake the leaves. Oh, right. Right? <laughs> right? And that's, that is a genuine, and I appreciate it. Yes, we're imposing labor on people. People may not want the tree in front of their house because there are different reasons why you may not find those are all legitimate reasons. That we need to try to balance the risks against the, the hassles that we're going to have to put up with. The question, though, is really stewardship. So yes. rather than ownership um, or, or you know, private ideas, it's the commons and the ideas. The commons. Um, but the, the, the tree, we need the tree, the tree needs us, mm -hmm. and so then there's a mutualistic benefit. But isn't there also money um, in the city for planting trees? There is, there's a million tree plants. Only a million. That's Only a million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but people are reforesting in their backyards. There is a greater fashion for it. Uh, there ha look, if you look at the old prints from the 1920s, streets of New York, there were no trees. There's more forests here than yeah. ever before. And uh, so that is the good news. Um, the bad news is there's still not enough of it. Right. We need to do it much faster, much more aggressively. And uh, otherwise, you're going to die. And the scale of projects that are going on in the city and the city's lack of faith in natural systems, it's, you know, it's just inherent everything that they do, that phytoremediation is not a process that's considered or, um, you know, softening edges and allowing marshes to come back and do their amazing carbon capture work that they're able to do and all these other things. It's just the multiplier effect of using a natural system as opposed to a built system has been neglected in the, in the, the city's mentality. Yes? Uh, 
There was no communication. It was like ridiculous. This is one big problem I think. Um, anyway, we, um, yeah, water water always does win. This is true. But it's been very interesting how um, like the Bucky Fuller Awards, the, the people who apply the brilliant concepts and ideas that uh, come to it because Bucky himself, I went to every single lecture he ever did when I was a student, wow. going from the outside in and the inside out, all at the same time. It, it wasn't like you, you were talking about, um, uh, you know, oh, going backwards. No, no, no. We don't want to go. We don't want to stay backwards. We want to go. We want to use yesterday to also uh, build on for tomorrow. And there's, there, uh, you know, Fuller it was so multidimensional, and and these contests that are running now, and I'm sure you've read them because I uh, because I think Roger Lina was sponsoring one one year or something. Um, they're incredible. Brilliant proposals. In the old days, people used to say, "Oh, Fuller's wacky." Or, no way. I mean, no. I I was obsessed. I remember, I was a kid. But people are saying, "Oh, these are not rational. They are very rational and impossible." I mean, look at um, you know, you're talking about energy. Look at the Nikola Tesla. Or, or uh, you know, using uh, propel, uh, propelling energy that goes all around the world, like ganging together, like we were ganging computing, ganging databases, da da da. You know, all of the things that we've become a little bit familiar with. Um, I don't feel as uh, it's scary. I have a, I have a kid. Uh, you know late in life, so, you know, I feel like I'm, what, a, what a mess we're leaving in with and, and all of our youth. Um, but I'm not so sure that it is so very different than, than prior. I think these, um, the devastations that were uh, in, in prehistoric times and in Times in um, other millenniums where, like um, Jewish people, for example, were at the bottom of of, of the of the hills, and in, in uh, uh, they they were always pushed down to the bottom. Um, they used the water to recycle. They they lived longest because they thought about how to use it. They thought, oh, put them down there because they'll get all the urine and the, the crap and the uh, and, and everything down there, and all, all the dynasties will be up on top of these architectural kingdoms. And, um, and boy, so seeing that, uh, reading and learning about that, really did show that ingenuity can have great effect. And there were just a lot of possibilities. Maybe I'm a stupid optimist mm -hmm. person, but there we go. <laughs> <coughs> First, I want to say it was very, very excellent. And I enjoyed it. You know, don't always enjoy them, but I, it was such a good time. And I have one question I want to direct to the curator from the historical side. In the Thomas Cole series, the, the fourth picture, not the fifth one, where, where everything is, you can't tell, if, tell me if I'm right or wrong, you can't tell if the civilization is coming apart or is being built. Am I correct in that? Yes. In that one particular yeah, that, I mean, so that's, it's not a regular cycle. Yeah, that's the, the conundrum. The cycle that Paul shows, it's 
makes a different comment in that fourth picture before it's all destroyed. So I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Yes, yes, and was not posing any answers uh, or any defined conclusions. I mean, he was really raising the possibility that there was no way to return. Yes. When you're considering, as you said, that the, the objects are about the past and the present, in what way do you see the work that you're doing or what people take from the experience of the historical objects as uh, helpful or instrumental for the future? Um, I think in a couple of different ways. Uh, so one of the things that distinguishes us from an art museum is that um, we, we, we have the tagline in um, our institution that objects tell stories. So for us, that means any object, whether it's two-dimensional, three-dimensional, has the power to tell a particular story. And really the trick is to figure out how to read them. <coughs> and I think any object that you read, you can read, um, you can read for what it might say about the past, you can read an object for what it might say about the present, but you can also start to think about what that object might be saying for and so that's one of the things that we do. The other thing that I think is very, very important for us is that we work a lot with very young people, from um, very young children to a lot of middle school through high school students, um, as well as college. And I have to say one of the things that I've learned in the last few years, and I'm not exactly the most optimistic person about the current state of events that we are living in, um, and I too feel like I'm leaving my to 20 year olds, uh, 20, late 20 children, a, a huge mess. But um, we're really finding that all of the middle schoolers and the college students and high school students are very, very open to learning how to read objects, whether they're art or you know, something that is kind of more gnarly looking, to understand what it says about the past, the present, and the future. But they're also really thinking. And they're really looking to be educated and to think about the future. They're very aware that our environment is, we've reached a crisis point. And I have to say in the last few years, and I actually, I, I also teach, um, right now I'm teaching a course for City University. Um, I've become much more optimistic about the future based on the young people because they are very thoughtful. And to hear that you've started a middle school that's a harbor school, and I don't know very much about it, but again, this kind of localized approach to educating children so that they can take those ideas and bring them forward. Um, you know, I, I've, I've become much more hopeful about the future and about solving climate crises and environmental crises based on the young people I meet. So I don't know if that answered your question. The, the title of the panel, Ostensibly <laughs> is uh, ecology, economy, and equity. And I don't know if, if any of you, you know, when invited you to join the panel, if you thought about that, thought about what it meant to you within the context of your practice or your or way of seeing the world. I don't know if you to, 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 to react to that or to the audience who all showed up to see this riveting topic on ecology, economy, and equity. Wait, I I just want to, I, so I, um, I come from a fairly traditional art history training, um, and I've certainly been very privileged in what I've been able to, um, how I've been able to be educated and the kinds of positions I've had. But one of the things that I, is very, very important to me and to my colleagues is to train the next generation. And we are really trying very hard to, to look for people who may not typically be involved in a museum setting or a library setting. And so um, a big part of my, my practice, actually, is to transmit my knowledge to a young generation and um, specifically to uh, young people who may not have formally been part of a museum or library conversation. So. Well, I was just thinking that the, the the most vulnerable like people in the world to climate change are women who are water carriers in 
usually non-Western countries. Um, and so that was my first thought. And my second thought is we all brought up the history of uh, Native Americans within this area. And I have several pages in my artist book about the Lene Lenapes. And in fact, the Gowanus Canal is arguably named after Chief Gawain. Um, so, you know, all of our major like freeways throughout this country are based on Indian trails. You know, Native, Native Americans people's means of transportation from point A to point B. Uh, but we definitely have to think about in our contemporary society neighborhoods that are really affected. I mean, I know Maddie helped in the projects here in uh, Red Hook when Sandy hit, you know, with so many people were, were flooded. Um, and I've read historical accounts of San Antonio, and San Antonio was notorious in the mid 20th century for the west side, which was all Latino flooding, horrible flooding. I mean, one of the worst floods in America hit San Antonio in the 1920s. So, uh, that does need to be wrapped into the conversation about how we, we do address uh, climate change. Uh, and of course, you know, that gets all involved in the political imaginations of what funds go where. And that's a, that's a very complex uh, conversation. And it's all the more complicated that the waterfront is changing. So historically, the waterfront was where the poor went. Small Valley land that was typically garbage dumps right outside our door. We had one of the biggest Hoover bills in New York City called Pork and Sur. It was Norwegian sailors that were trapped by the Depression. There were hundreds of them living in shacks literally outside of our door. And then we started putting all our public housing on the landfill marsh areas because it was the cheapest land the city could get. The irony now is that the money is trickling downhill. Wealthy people want to live on the waterfront again. And so we're getting a complete flip of socioeconomics where the poor are now getting pushed out to the suburbs that white people, wealthy people used to run out to. And now the Mexican dishwasher in my neighborhood commutes all the way to Bergen County using Spanish oh. transportation because that's where they can get the cheapest housing. And so the topic has become complicated. And the key issue is really integrated neighborhoods where poor people, old people, young people can stay together rather than the social apartheid that has naturally developed. And that is one of our big challenges. And actually, New York has met that challenge quite well. We have some very integrated neighborhoods in some ways. So it's not all together bad news. Okay. Whatever, please, please. I, I wanted to make a comment. Sure. Until I read um, one of the uh, the Nutmegs Curse by Avatar Ghosh, mm -hmm. I had not realized he made a statement in there, which evidently is true, which is that the largest polluter is are these um, bases, Air Force, Naval, um, and nobody ever challenges this. I, I actually, what I believe is that not only do they need to be challenged, but I think all of us, whether we are artists or not, need to have multi-dimensional practices to look beyond um, one area and see how it connects. Um, I feel that our resources of attention are limited. They are limited as a perceptual fact. And we have to be careful where we deploy our attention, where we're being distracted, and keep our eye on the ball. You know, as it becomes as it becomes more um, as it becomes worse and more people around the world see like what's going on in the Midwest and the tornadoes and all the other things that are dealing with climate change, I think we're going to get more uh, defensive and maybe come up with better ideas. I mean, I think it's, it's this balance of people's awareness 
of doing little things and then somehow influencing the bigger group and then the big group and the bigger group. And when you mention things like uh, airport bases, etc., airports, you know, giant sort of civic institutions. I mean, airplanes flying over our heads. I don't know if anybody saw the Times. There was this amazing little drawing or you know photograph of all the flights in one day. And we think about all that jet fuel and everything else. So it's really difficult not to get completely depressed about it, right? And do nothing. So there's this kind of common, and, and it's topic of discussion. I'm not saying I have an answer. To this. It, it gets depressing at times, and you sort of don't want to move on. So this community is a good thing. That's all. I, I um, I'm really but I don't know if you've touched on this before, but um, the huge impact we can all make by not eating animals. And if you want to just talk about water, just not eating fish. And that would, um, most of the plastic, you know, out in the water is from the fishing industry. So if we, if we stop the demand for fish, we would, you know, could stop the plastic out there, but stop, try to stop the demand for, um, you know, killing animals in uh, factory farms and slaughterhouses. Uh, it would, um, it's so much demand for water to feed them all and there's hardly any calories. But, you know, anyway, I didn't know if you talked about food. I haven't talked about food. It's, it's interesting one of the things, you know, so they say that there are three factors in climate change and that's uh, water, energy, Ready Center focuses in particular on water and energy. And food has been something that's always sort of like past Ready Center is the nonprofit that I'm a part of. And food is something that, that you know, you can't really exclude it, but it is, it is a focus that we haven't primarily um, been oriented towards. But it's interesting that because in the city, the production of food has historically been, you know, has, has been kept at a distance. So maybe we're processing the food, but but it, that sort of all belongs out in the, you know, outside. That's a big change that's happening. That you know, we have a farm. We have two farms here in the neighborhood. We have you know lots of patterns for rooftop farms or mm -hmm. for farms within apartments for people to to do some more food production. And I do think that the you know the slow food movement, the hand making of things and so on, is a kind of natural. People have this gut term because if I think about the food that I ate when I was a kid, you know, it was sort of like the peak of the processed food movement and we had no idea what it was like to eat things that you, you know, had made from scratch. So I think that there is there's definitely a change going on. David. You mentioned Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson and Ellen did as well. And New York twenty forty is a pretty grim book anyway. Because it's really describing how one lives. It's another hundred years. It's twenty one years. It's given us an extra sense of How you live in a world that's it's really it's really been inundated by water. But this more recent book, Ministry for the Future, is much more optimistic in a way. Listening, and there are several there are several things about it that sort of impinge on this panel. First one is that it begins with a horrendous heat wave in India. Apropos of what you were saying. It kills off several million people over about a three or four week period. Second thing is the mystery of the future is an economic thing. It recognizes the fact that the efforts that have been instituted since the Kyoto Agreements really had very little chance of success until there was an economic framework within which they really had the chance of some survival, which is interesting as well. And the third thing is that there are a number of, of components within this book that do actually do represent potential solutions. The one that, that's always, that pe always appealed to me, actually coming back to actually Gary's point about airplanes, as a quick aside, they basically go over the air to airships to effectively large dirigibles. Um, but the, the, the other thing that was really remarkable was the idea about trying to stop the glaciers in Antarctica from sliding into the ocean. And what they ended up doing in this was putting the wildcatters from Texas to work, drilling holes, pumping water up from underneath these glaciers because the glaciers were sliding on water. It was accumulating at the bottom and having the water freeze on top of the glacier. 
And the further there's some, you know, some I've forgotten the correct term for this, but glaciologists or whatever, they actually think this idea has some merit to it. So it, you know, it's just interesting that there are ways in which you can try to envision a solution to some of these problems. It may not happen, but there are ways to deal with it. Using the air, the oxygen from bubbling up to, to, to save it. And it's, it's, I believe that. And touching on both of the last two comments. Um, in my research for, about the Moanis Canal, my artist book, um, I learned a lot about oysters. Mm -hmm. And the Gowanus Canal oysters were like some of the best in the world. And they were as big as, as and tables. Small, small and babies. Babies. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were just huge. And I saw this remarkable video online that showed an aquarium with oysters. And and it was full of silt and all kinds of debris. I mean, you couldn't see at all. And within hours, those oysters had created clear water. You know, so I think you know that there is the oyster beds that are being developed. You know, where Sequanis and he's into the harbor. I think that's exciting. You know, and looking to what Tim has brought up, natural solutions. You know, to the environmental woes that we face. You know, I mean, nature's a lot smarter than we are. So Don't let's... separate us. <laughs> <laughs> because we have Brett in here, we, we actually have the spike that muscles are better than oysters. <laughs> because they filter faster, better, and then the yuppie oysters can then move into the <laughs> <laughs> so, there, there was like, yeah, there's a serious white flight issue that the oysters do not propagate in the Young Harbor. They all moved out to the Chesapeake and so on. But we're trying to bring them back in, right, Roy? Not a comment, just What do you all think about um, uh, people who are using plastics and like um, plastic debris to um, blanket the, o the ocean surface, you know, with, uh, you know, holes in it like a net, imagine a net woven with plastic garbage uh, mm -hmm. because it's cheaper and it also can, uh, you know, get built larger to, to, to save the earth or to save the sea. I've just read so many different things about these you know, it's knitting, fat, knitting yeah, fat, to fat, fat. Yes, to to, um, uh, to aerate underneath to to bring oxygen up. I'm just wondering if you do you find any value in that or I or it would. I, I, I don't know. It's been happening. It can uh, prevent so evaporation, I, but I don't see how it's going to bring oxygen in. I, I it, it's, an open, it's an open net. They're just using it. I can offer maybe the, I work with an and it's well in, in defense it's called break free from plastic, so it is an anti-plastic movement. Um, but we work with a lot of toxicologists who really center first and foremost that uh, like 99% of plastic is made from fossil fuels, right? <clears throat> the vast majority is made from frack gas. Uh, and the chemicals that are in it, like not just the additives in the plastic, but the plastic itself is inherently toxic. Um, so a lot of it has to do with microplastic. So especially in the oceans, actually, an organization called Five Gyres just put out a big report last week um, looking at data for the last like 30 or 40 years. Um, and the plastic pollution is something like a magnitude of like 11 times what they thought it was. So it's 171 trillion plastic particles in the ocean. The issue is that because of the nature of the plastic, first of all, the inherent toxicity, the fact that it's in our bodies, it's poisoning us and the animals, right? And then it's also the fact that plastic does not break down in the environment, it only breaks up into tinier and tinier microplastic pieces. Mm -hmm. And so that is, it's like this insidious, um, and just to put a finer point on it, I would say like whoever put that idea out there that got that article published that you wound up reading right, is like right. the most insidious form of capitalism I've ever seen. I've been doing this work for three years now, the plastic work. I've been doing environmental communications longer than that, but like it is literally if these petrochemical companies were not turning it into a PR campaign to like save the oceans, they would have to manage it as a toxic byproduct. 
So it's, I mean, I would call it greenwashing, but okay. I'd be curious okay. to see the specific yeah. example you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be putting down the use of, of these chemicals that they're trying to use the negative to create this like open weave net because it lasts all over. You can't, it does damn break down. And so, but it does break up into tinier pieces. The problem is like that itself is shedding throughout, like anytime you're using plastic, the, uh, under, like, under it's, the, it's like creating it's that that material itself is shedding. The gathering up the plastic pieces and the bottles that be quite these several different, you know, giant nets and everything. Is that a good thing in general? Like, so oh, it doesn't break down? You know, ultimately, ultimately, the I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to hijack the panel. What I'll say is, like, I um, the metaphor that we always use first and foremost is when you, let's say, you walk in your home, right, and your bathtub is overflowing. The first thing you do is turn off the tap. So it's a production supply side driven issue that, like, if we can stop these corporations from pumping all this plastic out yeah. and and then like, shoving it down our throats. Then we're going to be cleaning this up forever. It's like climate change, where it's like we're going to be—it's a mitigation thing, and it's like we're going to be dealing with this. My children, their children, their children for generations, right? Um, but the first thing we have to do is stop poisoning ourselves. Right. Yeah, I worked on the first solid waste management plan for the city 10, 15 years ago, and I can tell you we are generating more waste than ever before, despite all the really? mitigation programs. So we were four or five pounds per person per year, per day, sorry. Now we're up to six, seven pounds because of COVID, everyone, you saw the nice Amazon warehouse that's over there. <laughs> Guess what is that's generating? So there's more waste than ever before, and it is one of the critical issues that you're raising that we need to address. Consume less, package less, buy more local, less packaging, to try to make a difference. Let's see. Uh, yes, and I already for a long time thinking that it should be our food, local and seasonal. Mm, seasonal. So, you yeah. see, it's very important because every piece of a, a food in plastic, in particular plastic, and more uh, uh, like, uh, uh, how to say it? Mm. Uh, more vegetarian or vegan it is, more plastic they use. It's sometimes thick plastic because they, and uh, again, with all good intentions to be vegetarian or vegan, they use, uh, these people mostly use uh, artificial clothes uh, because it shouldn't be from um, uh, animal. So it's create vicious cycles. Yes, we try to be better. But actually, we create, and I read that on the south of Spain, there is, they say, there is a sea of plastic, they call it, that visible from, uh, from the space. It's not plastic in the water. It's plastic that covered the court houses that grow all this vegetarian, whatever, like, in every piece of, um, uh, every uh, like less than pounds of uh, uh, various is plastic uh, containers, and it's it's and these uh, hot houses on the on the south of Spain, it's uh, um, grow these um, berries and whatever vegetables uh, for the whole Europe. So it's and. Some say, okay, let's do hot houses with glass. Okay. But then it won't be that cheap. Yeah. You yeah. see? Yeah. So, so it's it's huge. It's one problem connected to another, to another, to another. And we're trying to be good, and with our good intention, where are we going? You do have a prototype of what you're describing in the Whole Foods. They have a very nice greenhouse on top of the Whole Foods where they grow local highly expensive vegetables packaged <laughs> in cellulose packaging. It's all 100% the way it should be. The challenge is how can we get it affordable? And that is the next scientific breakthrough. How can we provide free local production of consumer items that are made within our neighborhoods? And the more you can buy, the more you can make within the neighborhood, that is your challenge for the next 20 years. 
Yes, so what are your suggestions about making that work for this? Well, what we do is we let people make things in general. I mean, what we try to do, um, I think Rick, who's sitting right behind you, would understand this as well, is that we are giving kids uh, putting things in their hands to make things and telling them to make things because it was taken away. Is that going to solve? Uh, I think giving people, uh, getting people closer to nature, getting people closer to, to making and seeing how things are done as opposed to just putting it away and focusing on soft skills and so on. It's, you know, I think that there's a, there's a revolution in that. And I think that that is, you know, the, lo the local focus, the, you know, the responsibility that we're talking about here. And I think that, you know, we, we, we're, we're needing systemic change, but we're also needing to be an active, engaged component yeah. in that systemic change, as opposed to waiting for it to happen or, or you know, protesting. And I spent a lot of time protesting, and I have to say, it seems like the most, one of the, the least productive things yeah. that I can do, and I think it's better to, to do things and to stand against things. I, I work with the Broadest Bridges Canoe Club and the Conservancy, and I can say one thing that's heartening is all the young people coming there that are not digital zombies. They are actually people who want to learn how to do things with their hands, to solve problems, to dig a trench, to plant a tree, to make a thing. And I'm part of this whole maker movement in Brooklyn where we take apart cell phones and we figure out how to jerry rig them. And I just posted some kids who canoed all the way down from Canada down the Hudson, no cell phones. They have to sit on the shoreline around a traditional fireplace and tell tales. They were the heartiest, most beautiful young people I've ever seen in my life because they have recaptured their humanity. They kind of detached from the consumer world. And so there are there are hopeful movements out there. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. And there is an exhibition that I think Maddie would probably leave open a little bit longer if people want to walk around and see it. But there are more events coming. This is a jam-packed program related to the exhibition. Uh, so please come back, and thank you all very much for coming.